you realise you are the lucky ones. There are a few, sadly, who we just haven't been able to squeeze in. Um, but I'm not certain whether we've asked this of our speakers. We may well see if we can in some way repeat this talk so that those who uh, didn't get in uh, are able to hear it. Um, welcome to this Halloween meeting. Um, just a few parish notices before we start the main meet of the meeting. Um, as you should have seen when you came in on the table, the latest issue of Friends News is now out. Uh, we had a glitch with the distribution which we thought was contained to letters E, F and G in surnames, which we dealt with, but it has become apparent that there are a few H's who have also <laughs> not received the magazine. Uh, so if you are an H, uh, I think you can assume that you're in the category of you won't get one unless you grab one, uh, and please do so. Uh, and it would actually be useful to know exactly what your names are so that we can quite try and work out where the dividing line is between the haves and the have-nots that you've got. Uh, right, just a look ahead as we normally do at the future meetings and visits, and particularly an update on some of the visits in a second. Uh, the next meeting here uh, in four weeks' time uh, is Monday the 28th of November, uh, when Roy Watts, now Vice President until recently Chairman uh, of the Bluebell Railway Preservation Society, will be talking on the Bluebell Railway. Uh, probably the message from this meeting is do try and look. I gather there have been one or two glitches on the website, but we do have this system now where you can reserve a place on the website, so try to use that if you can. Um, an update on the visits. The Knights Riviera trip in January is now full. Uh, indeed, an overflow, a second one, the week after the dates we've advertised in January is also full from those who replied. That is largely catered for those who have so far <coughs> contacted Mike Kay. Mike is hoping to arrange a third identical itinerary uh, in early February to mop up anybody who still wants to come, and we know there are still some who haven't applied who do want to come. So if, you're, if you haven't applied for the January visits, uh, Mike Riviera, if you do want to come on a third one in February, email Mike K. his details are in the magazine, and just for the moment indicate that wish. And then once we know uh, the third one is going to run, Mike will be in touch to, to get some money out of you, I guess. Uh, I can also say, I'm afraid, that the visit to Ensign Bus on the 11th of February is also now full. Uh, we will try to arrange a second one for that, but at the moment, uh, if you kindly not apply, if you haven't, uh, because you're going to get a, I'm sorry, we can't fit you in response. Um, Mike hasn't updated me in the last week or so about the Croydon Tramlink tour on the 26th of February. When I last asked, there were places still available on that. So if anybody wishes to go on that, I suggest you send the booking form off fairly quickly uh, and hopefully you'll be accommodated. Right, I think that's all by way of parish notices. Uh, let's go on to the meat of the meeting. We know it's going to interest you because there are so many of you. Uh, it is an exciting new development next year when we have a new postal museum to look forward to and particularly we have <laughs> uh, the, the particular excitement of the possibility of seeing and riding uh, on the post office railway. The first automated underground railway. It wasn't the Victoria Line, it was the post office railway. Um, so I think uh, I'm right in saying that Hannah is going to kick off, probably introduce herself and her colleague. Uh, and I will hand over to her. Thank you, Barry, and thank you everyone for turning out today and for inviting us here to talk to you about the Post Museum and Mail Rail. Um, so who are we? Thank you. As Barry said, I'm Hannah Gledhill and I'm the client side project manager for the Postal Museum. Um, so my role essentially is to try and coordinate uh, all the elements that come together for a large scale capital project. Uh, for those of you that don't know, what we're doing is uh, it's a £26 million capital building project of a brand new postal museum in central London, uh, aiming to open spring next year. <coughs> and alongside of that, we're hoping, hoping to open up a segment of the former post office 
Railway, known to us now as Mail Rail. So I'm joined tonight by my colleague Chris Taft, who is our Head of Collections, and really he's our in-house Mail Rail expert. So there's not many people who know more about Mail Rail than Chris. No pressure there then. Um, <laughs> you might recognise Chris's face from shows such as The Great British Railway Journey with Michael Portillo. So whenever there's any filming, Chris is there in front of the camera. Um, and he is going to be talking you through the history of the Post Office Railway. But just before Chris does that, I'm just going to do a few introductory slides about <coughs> our organisation, the Postal Museum. <coughs> Um, Chris is then going to talk to you about the history and then I will follow on with what we're doing to open up Mail Rail as a visitor attraction. Okay. Um, I, I won't run through the whole history of our organisation but some of you will remember when uh, the National Postal Museum which was based near St Paul's Cathedral closed back in 1998. It closed because they sold the site there um, and then we had to move a lot of our collections into storage until we found a new home for them. Um, so that has really been the, the aim over the past 20 odd years. Um, it was made easier in 2004 when we formed a charity called the Postal Heritage Trust and we combined our care of both the museum collection, our archive collection and our philatelic collection. Um, and so that really has been our aim, to find a home for all three of those collections and to put them on display for people to see. So just on, uh, over five years ago, 2011, uh, site became available at Mount Pleasant, and I'll show you just where uh, in a second. And from that point onwards, really, the project has gone through various iterations. So at the beginning, Mail Rail wasn't even uh, a feature. It was just the Postal Museum, Postal Museum on its own. Um, then Mail Rail became available, and we kind of grabbed it with both hands, because you'll see from today's talk, it's it gets people interested. Um, it's very unique. Earlier this year we rebranded as the Postal <coughs> Museum. Before that we were known as the British Postal Museum and Archive and that's our logo there in the top right hand corner. And as I said earlier we aim to open in spring next year. So where are we based? So this is zoomed in on Mount Pleasant Mail Centre there in the um, bottom centre. So Mount Pleasant is situated kind of smack bang in the middle of three major train stations. You've got King's Cross to the north and then Farringdon and Chancery Lane. So we're a little bit of the beaten track, but still very easily accessible. Where we're based now is that block A. So this is actually within the Mount Pleasant sorting office building itself. It's called Freeling House. And what we currently have on offer is a search room for researchers to visit and we also have our underground repository stored there. So um, that's where our archive is, that's where some of our museum collection is. And where are we moving to? Not too far. Just up the road there where Block B is, and that's going to be our new postal museum home. Um, it's an existing building that was given to us by Royal Mail and we're extending it into places to the north and to the west and then just across the road we have the mail rail experience so you essentially just need to cross the road enter at ground floor level and then head underground for the mail rail experience and um, just to make things extra difficult they're both on two different in two different boroughs so <laughs> block b is camden block c is islington so a lot of applications that we put in we have to put in twice and get two approvals but that's um hopefully that headache will <coughs> will end once we're open um and just briefly we're going through a huge period of organizational change at the moment so just to try and show you in numbers we currently have around 40 <coughs> staff. We're aiming to double that when we open next year. Um, not just in terms of numbers, but also the profile of our staffing. So currently half our staff are collections focused. They're curators, they're archivists, philatelists. Um, but in the new centre, we clearly need to maintain them, but we also need to develop a lot more operational expertise. And um, for example, our head of operations that joined us a few months ago, she's come to us from the Museum of London. So we're having to bring in a lot of that expertise that we don't currently have. 
We have 15 uh, very valuable volunteers currently with us, so working on smaller projects and also trying to help us prepare our collections for our move across the road. Uh, we have an ambitious plan to increase that to about 120 to 150, uh, and those volunteers will really help enhance the front of house offer um, of our exhibition spaces. And it is a really ambitious target. So through our search room, we currently see between two and 3,000 visitors, predominantly researchers a year, and we're hoping to achieve about 185,000 a year. Uh, so clearly in order to achieve that, we have taken a good look at our audience. We want to maintain the current audience, but we've had to reach out to a much wider audience. So through our plans, through our exhibitions, we've tried to tailor them to different target groups. So there's a lot more for families to do, for example. Um, there's Mayor Rail in itself appeals to a younger audience who are interested in hidden London. That's on trend at the moment. So through targeting those different audiences, that is how we hope to hit and actually beat that 185,000 visitors a year. Uh, so that, that talks to you a little bit about the transformation we're going through as an organisation. Uh, Chris is going to talk you, take you back through time and talk you through the story of the Post Office Railway. Right, good evening everyone. Thank you, Anna. Um, <coughs> Yeah, as Hannah says, I'm going to talk to you um, for about half an hour about the history of the railway and introduce it to you a little bit, give you an idea of, of what the railway was. Um, most of you, I'm sure, have a, a bit of an awareness of it already, but, but hopefully there'll be some insights into its history for you this evening. Um, to go back to the sort of very beginning of the history of the railway, um, that really goes back to the 1850s when... Um, various sort of experimentation and thoughts were going into to what, what could be done to solve uh, the issue of movement of mail across London. London's always been the centre of the postal network from the very beginning of, the, of postal communication in this country. London has been the heart and where everything has really you know, had to come to and go through. Um, and as you'll, you will all be very well aware, um, the railway stations in London, when, when the railway started to, to be used, weren't where the sorting offices were. So the mail was beginning to have to be transported from sorting offices like Mount Pleasant to, to railway stations like Liverpool Street and Paddington. So solutions were, were needed to try and ease the problem of the congestion of London. Um, the first sort of recorded um, sort of discussion that was had by the, by the post office board at the time happened in 1855. Um, and practicalities of an underground pneumatic tube system were explored. Um, it was concluded that it was possible and, and a practical thing to do, but it was decided that it was just too expensive. Um, and so in 1855, the decision was taken to actually abandon the idea. However, it wasn't to be abandoned for very long, because shortly afterwards, um, an experiment took place with a pneumatic dispatch system. A private company called the Pneumatic Dispatch Company set up a trial of... Um, these pneumatic tubes. They worked like giant pea tubes essentially. Mail bags were loaded into containers, um, the containers were put into pipes, and then a big steam generator was used to power, blow and suck these containers through these pipes at um, speeds of up to about 30 35 miles an hour. This was done as a trial initially in uh, Battersea and demonstrated, and the post office were interested, so um, further experimental track was set up and um, run as an experiment between Evershelf Street Post Office and Euston Station. The trial was reasonably successful and it worked very well. It was extended and the scheme was extended eventually right through to the Post Office headquarters at St Martin's Grand, close to where the National Postal Museum um, was based until 98. The experiment, however, came to an end um, in the late 1860s. Um, it was reintroduced <coughs> in the 1870s, but by 1874, the Post Office decided that the scheme wasn't for them, it was too expensive, um, and they decided to abandon it. So in 1874, the pneumatic dispatch company went out of business as a consequence of losing the, the potentially massive contract that the post office offered them. Um, and the, the idea of the pneumatic railway um, sort of passed. However, by the beginning of the 20th century, the problem of congestion in London was getting worse, not better. And um, once again, it was necessary to um, sort of explore options. 
So in 1909, a, a commission was put together, chat with Robert Bruce, who was um, controller of the London Postal Region at the time, <coughs> chaired this committee, um, and they looked into all the possibilities, all of the options. The reason, one of the reasons we know so much about the pneumatic system um, and some of the other schemes that happened before that is because of this document, this historical account of, um, of the earlier schemes, essentially. 1911, the report was published. Um, the conclusion was that what was required was an underground driverless electric railway system. So they looked at the pneumatic <coughs> system. Um, obviously, technology was moving on by the beginning of the 20th century, and it was concluded that an underground driverless electric system was the, was the answer for London. Post Office as a government department, so an Act of Parliament was required. <coughs> that Act passed in Parliament in 1913, Post Office London Railway Act, as it became. Um, which is still in force, still on statute books, and we've had to uh, look into that as part of our part of our project in terms of the um, conditions that are imposed on it by that act. Almost immediately, in fact, even before the act was passed, experiments and trials took place. Um, an experimental track was set up in uh, Chelmsford in Essex and also Woolwich Arsenal, and. What they did was they developed a very small, narrow gauge train. They, they, they developed a, a, a train that was designed to accommodate the largest parcel that was permissible to take on the uh, through the post office at the time. So it was a small container with a lid that sat on a narrow gauge track. And they ran this experiment at Woolwich and, as I say earlier, at Chelmsford. Nothing survives um, apart from a couple of um, images of that trial, and there's a little bit of documents in a, in our archive. But uh, no physical evidence of it survives. Bits of it were used in the railway that was eventually built. But the trains that were um, experimented with um, were very, very different to the trains that were eventually to be developed for the railway. So the railway ran as designed underneath the City of London or underneath London. Um, and it went from the Paddington Station, the railway station at Paddington, to the Eastern District Office at Whitechapel on the Whitechapel uh, Road next to the Royal London Hospital. <coughs> and it took in, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the district offices. London had a number of different district offices. Each district had its own district office. Um, and it took in two of the principal railway stations, Liverpool Street and Paddington. There were plans and schemes to extend the railway. So the idea was to extend it up to the Northern District Office, for example, down to the South East District Office, the South West District Office, and to other stations like Waterloo and Victoria. None of those extensions were ever built, and none of that ever happened. Um, however, the, um, some of the tunnels were actually extended ever so slightly to allow that extension to be built and, and be made easier. And should they ever needed to extend it, they could do so without interrupting the service. So. The, the intended route, or the actual route, um, as it was designed, was from the Eastern District Office on to um, Liverpool Street Station, where it connected with, of course, the mainline trains at Liverpool Street, then to King Edward Building, which was the foreign section sorting office at the time in London, onward to Mount Pleasant, which was the main inland section office as opposed to the foreign section office, then down to the Western Central Office, to the Western District Offices, and there were two offices serving the Western District, and finally to Paddington Station and to the mail centre uh, for sorting office that was at Paddington. The actual appearance of the network and the tunnels is very, very similar to London Underground stations. Um, that's no accident, no coincidence. Um, it was designed in some ways by the same um, people. The actual consulting engineer for the railway was a chap called Harley Hugh Darrantle Hay, who was the, the, the chief consulting engineer, might be a name that's familiar to some of you. He wasn't a post office employee, but he was one of the few people involved who wasn't a post office employee because largely this was an in-house project. Um, the electrical systems were designed by the um, chief power engineer for the post office and the, the, the whole scheme was managed by the engineering chief for the post office. So it was very much an in-house development but bringing in a little bit of external expertise as they needed it and um, Hay was responsible for um, the, the design of the infrastructure of the tunnels so bringing in his, his knowledge and for that. So the tunnels are single bore tunnels running between stations. They open out into separate tunnels that run either side of each station and there's a sort of central platform here. So you get a set of tracks coming either side of that central island platform. And the um, segments of, of tunnel, cast iron seg uh, 
tunnel segments that, that bolt together, that hold the structure together. Exactly the same as on many of the deep uh, London Underground stations. So the way essentially it worked is that mail was brought down from the offices um, or the stations above. It was brought down via um, a chute usually, a helter-skelter like chute. The bags of mail would come down, would be loaded into metal containers by a platform worker. <coughs> And from there, those containers pushed onto one of the trains, which was obviously set on the platform. And from there, they were then dispatched on um, down the line um, automatically. So, as I mentioned a minute ago, it was a completely automated driverless system. So, the, the route was um, trains obviously loaded up. The route was then determined by a uh, control system. <coughs> Each station had its own control panel which set the route the trains were to run on. Um, they were controlled through the station by that controller, but as soon as they left the station area, they were then under automatic control, and they journeyed on to the next section. They moved section by section down the line to the next station where the, the control was taken over, <coughs> and those trains were stopped as required. Trains could pass straight through stations if needed. When it reached its destination, the um, <coughs> mail was taken up to the station or to the office above. Um, in the case of Paddington, which is where this image is from, is a, a 390 foot long conveyor that went straight up to the station above, took the mail directly onto platform number 8 at um, Paddington Station, where the, the TPO, the Travelling Post Offices, were, were you, would usually be ready to receive and to offload the mail um, in the same way. As I mentioned, each station had a switch frame which controlled the trains and the movement of the trains. It was essentially a signal frame um, which determined whether trains would pass through or stop at each uh, individual and particular station. Mount Pleasant is the biggest and the most complex of the stations. Um, it has uh, the most levers on the frame uh, because there's more track movement. There's also the car depot, which we'll, we'll come on to again in a minute. Um, but each of the stations at one time had one of these sets of frames. In 1990s, in the 1993, this was all automated under a computer system, so the computer took over the control of the routes and the setting of the routes. It was controlled from one machine in Mount <coughs> as opposed to at each individual station. But the technology behind it and the way it worked electrically remained exactly the same um, from the early days of its development. <coughs> The platform worker was the person responsible for dispatching the train, so while the route was set by the controller, it was a platform worker that actually let the trains uh, go. So that was part of the sort of safety feature um, to ensure that it was all loaded up, and all everything was closed and secure. They would press a button which would engage the automatics and the train would then move off under automatic control once its route had been both set, approved and, and checked to be clear. A lot of the control apparatus for the railway sat underneath the platform, so the platforms and stations areas themselves are obviously cylindrical tunnels, so the, the top part of the, the tracks and the, uh, the trains, and then underneath was where all of the uh, electrical systems and a certain amount of accommodation for, for workers uh, was as well. <coughs> so to jump back to the history and to its having sort of given you an overview of what it was and how it worked, to, think a little bit about how it was built. So I mentioned 1913, passing of the Act of Parliament. Construction work began quite quickly, and the intention was to have the railway um, up and running um, you know, fairly, fairly speedily. And um, unfortunately, the, the First World War um, caused delay to the construction. Um, inten originally, they intended it to be done within about 15 months. Um, in the end, it would take a, a lot longer than that. Construction work initially continued during the First World War, uh, and in fact construction didn't stop until 1917, so well into the war. Um, however, by 1917, while they built the tunnel network itself, the, the series of tunnels, they hadn't laid any of the track and they hadn't done any of the electrification for the track. So work stopped, but they had a complete tunnel network at that point. So alternative uses were found for the tunnels, and, and actually a number of art collections and museums approached the post office and asked if they could store artworks and treasures in the tunnels during the war. First World War, not Second World War, but you still had, of course, the Zeppelin raids, which were wreaking destruction and, and havoc on London at that time. And there was fear that some of these um, you know, priceless treasures would be, would be damaged. So works from the British Museum and also from the National Portrait Gallery, the Royal Academy, and some private collections were stored um, temporarily during the war 
in some of the, the, the tunnels. These are in works from the National Portrait Gallery that were stored uh, in the tunnel. So this was a sort of temporary um, wartime use. Um, the war ended, these were items were all removed from the tunnels. Um, but construction work didn't immediately start again. In fact, they looked quite seriously at whether it would continue. It's my belief um, that had they not got quite as far as they had at that point, had they not basically built the tunnels and done what was arguably the most difficult bit, I think it probably could well have been an abandoned scheme. They could have just said, actually, you know, we're not going to not going to proceed with it now. However, they decided after much discussion that they would proceed. It was 1924 before construction work um, carried on. Uh, at that point, they started laying the tracks into the tunnels and started um, you know, the process of, of, of electrifying the network. And as a consequence, it was 1927 before the railway was complete and was opened. It actually opened at the end of 1927 um, in time just to deal with the Christmas pressure that year. Um, and then they opened, they opened half the network at that point, and they opened the remaining half of the network um, at, the, um, at the beginning of the following year, 1928, where it operated fully. It then continued in operation pretty much um, seamlessly for um, the rest of its operating life, really. I mean, there were things that happened, there were some changes, there were some modifications. 1960s, 1965, two of the Western District offices, the two offices that performed essentially one function there, were both closed down and the new Western District office was built just off um, Oxford Street, Rathbone Place. Um, during the Second World War there was um, continued use of the railway, so they had, um, you know, it became even more important during the Second World War to, to have this means of moving mail under the streets of London. Um, away from the, the dangers above ground. So it wasn't used for public sheltering, which is what people often ask. Um, they, the post office did have its own air raid wardens and they did take shelter down here, but they didn't use it for artwork storage like they did in the First World War because actually it had a much more important function in many ways of carrying on getting the mail moving under the streets. Um, and and you know, communication, postal communication in particular during the First and Second World War was extremely important to people, as you can well imagine, I'm sure. So the railway, as I say, carried on really um, much as it much as it did um, after that. There are, I say, a few a few accounts of various modifications and changes, but largely um, it did what it does. Just talk to you a little bit about the rolling stock as well, because I think people are often interested to know what the trains that ran on the railway were. Um, you had a, a glimpse of a few of them as we've gone through. This is a drawing, we have a drawing within the archive of some, a number of drawings of different developments of trains and designs of trains. Um, and the early design was for a four-wheel rigid body train. Um, that was quite a short wheelbase, rigid design. Um, a prototype for it was built um, and that was modified and, and created into what became 90 rail cars that were used on the rail. So these were short wheelbase things four wheels and they had a central section in the middle that held a big container of mail and then two smaller sections either side that would allow uh, additional mail and the motors sat underneath those that, that ran them. Now, it, you know, this was the design that they'd come up with, this is what they'd been, been working on in the early years. However, the, the post office appointed um, a chap called Evan Evans, um, again a name that might be familiar to some of you, he, he actually worked for London Underground, he was a, a manager, an operating manager on London Underground, and the post office seconded him uh, for a couple of years onto their team to help with the operational side of this. They were very good with the postal side, they knew what to do, they were very good on the engineering side, the technical side, but they, they, they weren't railway operators, they didn't operate railways. So they brought Evan Evans in to advise them um, and to, to be their sort of first manager, the first governor he's known as still in the, in the railway. And one of the things he observed was that the design of these trains was, was flawed. Um, there was a number of very tight um, curves to take trains around. There were loop sections that would allow trains to be turned around because the railway worked like a giant conveyor belt, really. Things went from one end, reached the end, turned around and came back again and carried on like that all day. Evans realised that the, the rigid design of these trains and the fixed uh, wheelbase of them would cause problems on cornering, would cause wear both on the track and on the wheels itself. Evans actually came up with his own sketch for um, a design of train, and he suggested an articulated design. So you have two bogey units and a central um, train <coughs> that um, 
sat, or, uh, sat in the centre. And this, by being articulated, meant that it could be much longer, um, which meant that you could get much more mail on it. So you could actually accommodate four mail containers instead of the sort of one and two halves that you got on the on the on the first design of train. Um, he suggested this before the railway opened. However, his his idea was sort of overruled, and, and they carried on with the original four wheeled rail car design that they'd um, set out with. However, when the powers that be at the post office sort of heard about his design, some of them realised that actually he had a point, and, and more to the point, when the railway started operating, they realised he had a point, and exactly what he predicted would happen happened, and they found that they were, were suffering an excessive amount of wear both to the wheels and to the track. And so new trains were required. And in 1930, remember it opened at the end of 1927 with 90 brand new trains. In 1930, they introduced a, a fleet of, of new trains. They completely redesigned the train, almost exactly to Evan Evans' design. So two bogey units um, with a central flatbed unit that would accommodate the four male containers. Um, and this design of train, much, much more successful, and this became the standard <coughs> train design for many, many years. The 1930s stock train, we call it, as opposed to the 27 stock that we had before. The 1927 stock, very little of it survives. Most of it was um, cannibalised and used in the, um, in the later trains. One or two of them were converted for other purposes, um, and one was um, <coughs> preserved as a, a, what they then termed a museum piece, and has now become an actual museum piece. <laughs> So the 1980s trains um, were say much more successful. However, they of course were um, you know, ha having to look at the future. Um, in the 1960s, some prototypes were made for a new uh, fleet of trains to replace these. However, that never really happened. They, they made three prototypes um, that were used, um, but they never then developed the actual rolling stock that, that, to follow it. Um, it was in sort of late 70s that some of the post office managers on the railway, the railway managers, contacted the, you know, the post office, the, the people upstairs, and said, you know, what happened to these new trains you promised us? We, they were using trains that had operated since the 1930s. Uh, but eventually, the new fleet of trains did arrive, um, and these are what we've known as the greenback trains, the 1980s stock trains. These came in in 1980. There were about 30 of these trains built. They're actually built under contract with a company called um, Hunslet Holdings. The original contract was awarded to Greenwood and Batley, which is why the trains are known as Greenback trains, and they were all badged as Greenback. But only two of them were actually made by Greenback, the remainder were made under, under the contract with Hunslet Holdings. These were brought in in 1980 uh, and brought into use, and these became the trains that continued to the end of the operating life of the railway. And these trains actually. Um, supplemented the 30s trains. So the 1930s trains did carry on, and right up to the last day of the railway, some of the 1930s trains were still running and being used. It was in the 1980s, 1987, that there was a sort of rebranding exercise. The name Mail Rail comes in for the first time. Prior to that, it was always just the Post Office Railway, or the Post Office London Railway, to get its proper title. Mail Rail came in purely as a rebranding exercise, um, really just to sort of promote the railway a little bit. Um, and to advertise it. Some fiberglass cowlings were added to the trains. Um, these were a bit of a disaster, if we're honest. Um, there were five of them, five or six of them made. Um, <coughs> the very first ones they did, they bolted them onto the train, they sent the train down the tunnel, it got smashed to bits on the tunnel wall because they'd measured it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and they do it. Um, they had a light on the front. Um, so that the driver was trying to see where it was going, <laughs> <laughs> and some of them were even given names. This is this one, and it's the City of London. So there, there was another one. Um, there was, uh, a couple of them were named, um, and um, the, the cowling that was added was purely for show. It was purely for publicity photographs, so the great and good could stand next to them and have their photograph taken. It had no practical purpose at all, and in fact didn't last very long at all. And they were all taken off and, and put into storage and we've now acquired all of them for the collection. To do with, we know not what, but um, <laughs> we've got them. Um, and they're filthy, and they're horrible, and they're broken. But we've got them, and we love them. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the engineering side of things very quickly, because I know it's something that interests people. There was a, a railway workshop, a car depot, or car shed, as it was known, maintenance workshop. It was a general purpose workshop, originally designed as a marshalling yard, but later um, sort of set up to um, 
to do general works and repairs. And that's at Mount Pleasant. So Mount Pleasant has always been a very important part of the railway. It's always in the centre of the network. It's been the, you know, the head office for the railway, really. Um, so the, the maintenance workshop um, was equipped with all the tools and equipment needed to maintain the railway. One of the things I think is most remarkable about Mail Rail is the, is the engineering story, really. It's the fact that so much was done in-house. It was all done in-house. You know, apart from the building of the train, which was done um, externally and brought in, everything else was done in-house. So the team of engineers they had working with them, the best engineers you could get, and they, you know, they really knew what they were doing with, with all of the, the electrical systems. And remember, this was so far ahead of, of its time and so far advanced for what it was at the time it opened. The maintenance workshop was really the sort of hive of activity at one time, and, and the maintenance workshop will be the centre of the new Postal Museum Visitor Experience, which we'll talk a little bit more about shortly. Pretty much everything that was required could be done in the depot. There were pits introduced, inspection pits, so that trains could be worked on from underneath or examined, or brakes could be changed, for example. Um, wheel sets could be turned round, uh, that was something that was particularly important. The very early, uh, early, early days of the train, when uh, the railway, when they realised this problem with the, the short wheelbase 27 rail cars, they had to be regularly turned off the wheels to overcome this problem. And it had staff uh, in its time um, across the railway, not just engineers, but of about 220 staff at its peak. So it was operating during its peak, operating 22 hours a day. It was 24 hour operation, but the railway ran 22 hours a day. It used to close down between 8 in the morning and 10 in the morning for maintenance purposes, so track inspections could take place, any repair works that were needed, any amendments or changes to track or replacement of rail and things like that would take place during maintenance periods. Um, and at one time it was operating as an as a, uh, everyday sort of operation. In order to help with the maintenance, uh, battery locomotives were um, designed and manufactured at the beginning of the railway. They date from 1926, so they were designed and built just before the railway opened. And the idea of these battery locomotives were that obviously it was uh, powered on the third rail of the railway, so it took all its power from the central rail, um, which moved the trains through the, through the network. But if that power was failed, or, or when the maintenance was required, or if trains broke down and needed to be recovered, battery locomotives were, were made. Three were designed and built. All three of them still exist, and all three of them are still in the railway. Um, I think. In a way, these are perhaps the, the most sort of remarkable bits of kit in the railway, and these are, are, are perhaps one of the things I think really um, you know, deserve some, some credit for the, 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 the contribution they've made to the railway, because they, say 1926, they were built, um, and they were used regularly throughout the operation of the railway, and they were used and they worked, uh, they worked very efficiently. Um, they are about seven tonnes each of battery, double bank of batteries in the middle, lead, lead acid batteries, um, and they um, were capable of, they were designed to be able to pull um, a complete train full of mail out of a tunnel if it broke down, um, and they were also designed to recover one another. Um, so they, what they actually found, they did some experiments on them in the early days, and they, they were found they were capable of hauling a static load of 52 tonnes, which is an incredible weight for, for something powered uh, to, on batteries at that time to do. Um, and as I say, they still remain, and, and one of them will be in the exhibition area at, at the Post Museum at Mayor Rail to, to, for people to be able to see. There's a single driving position on these battery locomotives, so one operator sat just inside and actually controlled it and drove the thing. Um, wasn't very much room at all. Um, the railway was designed for uh, moving mail and very narrow <coughs> tunnels in places. So there was obviously a limit to what, um, what space they could offer people. A special carriage was created in order to carry people around. It was never designed to carry people, the railway. It was never uh, built to carry people. But um, one, of the, one of the 1960s prototype trains was actually converted into what they called a VIP car, designed to carry passengers and guests around the railway. <coughs> never done regularly, never done with any, any degree of regularity. But, but as and when it was required, it was done. Sometimes for inspection purposes as well, for practical you know, tra uh, you know, for engineering inspections or tunnel inspections and things as well. So the history of the railway is um, clearly sort of a fascinating one. It, it, it's probably worth just before I hand back to Hannah to talk about the plans for the future, just answering what if I don't 
say now will be the first question that's asked guaranteed when we stop is about why the railway closed. So it ceased operation in 2003. What essentially happened was that postal operations changed and the way operations in London in particular changed. So where you had district offices in each district, so the West Central District, to the North District, the South East District, all had their own district offices. And these were huge buildings. If you know Mount Pleasant, you know how big a building that is. If you know the old uh, Western Central District Office just down from the British Museum off um, Holborn, um, that's a huge building, huge, huge building. That was the district office for one district. Gradually, it was becoming less and less necessary to have such big district offices for every single district. <coughs> in actual fact, partly because of the machines in these offices, a lot of it would be automated and a lot of the work could be done by fewer and fewer offices. At the same time, um, the there was a movement away from using the central London Rail Terminal as um, places where the travelling post offices could go out of. So by the mid-1990s, we were beginning to lose some of these district offices, and in 1995, <coughs> the decision was taken by Network Rail, not by, um, not by the post office, that, that a new rail hub was to be created at Willesden, Princess Royal Distribution Centre, it was to be called, and this was part of a project called Railnet, and the railway were moved, the railway, po travelling post office railways were moved out of central London. So now the big part of the point of the, of the mail rail ceased. It was no longer going where it needed to go to. So gradually <coughs> they um, were losing stations on the line and by the year 2000 there were really only three stations that mail was being moved between. That's Paddington, Mount Pleasant and Rathbone Place. Paddington in the years since has, has closed and there's no mail centre at Paddington anymore. Rathbone Place closed years ago. So essentially the railway stopped going where it needed to go. Um, so that really was what led to um, the decision in 2003 to stop the railway and to mothball the railway while a new future was decided for it. And that new future has now come along in the form of plans for the Postal Museum, which Hannah will now give you a bit more of an insight into. <coughs> Thanks Chris. Um, I'm going to focus on mail rail, but I just have a couple of slides to set the scene with the Postal Museum. So this visual here is our architect's impression of what it will look like from the street. So we have the existing three-storey building that you can see on the left there, that's the red brick building formerly known as Calthorpe House. And uh, we have extended it to the north, which will form our welcome area. So that it will have in there what you would expect any museum, like the Transport Museum to have, it will have a shop. A cafe, a reception desk, um, and it will also be extended to the west, and that's where our archive repository is going to be. <coughs> On the ground floor of the red brick building is going to be one of our two exhibition spaces. So um, across the two sites, we have around a thousand metres squared of exhibition space, half over here and half underground in the maintenance depot that Chris just talked about. On the first floor here, we're going to have a dedicated learning space. So this will be the first time ever that we can um, bring schools in, in any large numbers to us. And um, at the moment, a lot of our education services are outreach. So we have to go to the schools. So that's a huge bonus for us. We're going to have a state-of-the-art conservation studio so our conservators can keep up the good work conserving our collections. And we'll have a new look search room. It will be similar to the one we have now, but we've um, redesigned it a bit so it's more in keeping with our current needs. And then on the top floor of note, we have a new digitisation studio. So we will have uh, a brand new large format scanner, which will help us in our um, aim to digitise all of our collections, get them online and then reach much wider audiences. So this is just a plan of the exhibition over at the Postal Museum. Roughly, um, it, it takes you through chronologically, so the story starting with the birth of Royal Mail and through to the current day. So we're hoping that particularly children who come to visit will see the link between the way that they communicate today and, um, for example, social media, how that actually has a link through right to the birth of communications, essentially. Um, we're also going to be exhibiting some of our uh, vehicles in here, our pillar boxes, the world-renowned Penny Blacks will be seen in here, and uh, 
the intention is that it's a very interactive experience. So it's, there are graphic panels, but there's not only graphic panels. So there's things for people to play with, adults, children to play with. Um, and then you end up in a temporary <coughs> exhibition space, which we will clearly rotate throughout um, well, each year. So that is the Postal Museum. Over the road, so you enter at street level and you're faced <coughs> with another shop and another welcome area. And uh, one of the key selling points is actually this soft play area. So um, as with other museums, we have created a space for children <coughs> ages eight and under because the content of the rest of the exhibition is perhaps not as focused to their age range. So they'll learn through play in this space. They can uh, dress up as a postie, they can post a letter at the post office, they can sort the letter. <coughs> You see there's climbing, pulleys, slides involved, and then they can post it, um, sorry, then they can deliver it through a, a mailbox. So that's just a fun feature that we have in order to attract a wider audience. Then when you go underground, you'll be met with this scene, and this is what it looks like, or it looked like before we did any work in there, and we're <coughs> aiming for it to not look too much different. So. Uh, the point of our project is to preserve the industrial heritage of Mail Rail, not to take it and transform it hugely. Um, what you will see in this space in particular is a, a brand new raised floor because <coughs> there are trip hazards everywhere. You'll see there's rails running all through it. Um, and we also need to be able to provide wheelchair and pushchair access. But also from a um, construction point of view, we're going to be running a lot of our mechanical and electrical services under that floor, so you don't need to see them running along all of the walls. So this is the space that you will enter into first, uh, and here you'll be given an introduction to the exhibition, you'll see a video, and it's also where you'll start to queue for your train ride. And that block there is where the trains will be sat, waiting for you to board, uh, and then they'll head off into that tunnel and I'll speak a little bit about the loop in a second. You come back to the same site and get off the train and then you make your way around the uh, right hand side of the depot and here you're going to see a cityscape along the wall and what it will essentially do is set out the railway route and what sits above it in London so it provides some context to where railway actually runs. And then this side of the depot is the other 500 metres squared of exhibition that I was talking about. And in here we're able to display some of our larger exhibits, uh, some of our larger vehicles. One of, I think the, last, the first exhibit has gone in today. Um, and that will really form the end of your, your experience here at Merrill. So just to talk, to talk a bit more about the ride, I've used this uh, network diagram just to show where we're situa situated. So Chris explained how it ran from Paddington, which you can see in the top <coughs> left, right through to Whitechapel in the bottom right. The area that we are situated in is Mount Pleasant, and that's the area with the uh, lovely coloured cloud around it. <coughs> Apologies for the blurry picture here, but you'll see what I'm trying to do. This is the Mount Pleasant route. So you'll start your journey here. This is the, um, the maintenance depot. And you're gonna go on a 17 minute journey in all. And you're essentially going to be transported through the tunnels as if you're a piece of mail. <laughs> so it's, it's like a figure of eight, but you don't cross over. So you head off in this direction and then you stop at this platform, platform number one. Here you'll see visuals of mail rail workers working and socialising, I mean they had dartboards on the platforms. Um, there'll also be a kind of immersive World War II experience, you'll hear bombs going off. It's very immersive, there's a lot of audio-visual um, techniques going on here to accompany your ride. And then you keep going round, and there's various things going on as you're going round, I won't tell you because it'll spoil them all. Um, at this platform, this is where we better demonstrate how mail rail works. So you'll see a video of uh, a letter being posted at street level, and then you'll see its journey through the Mount Pleasant <coughs> sorting office, and then you'll see it making its way down the chutes that Chris is talking about, and then loaded onto a train. 
So hopefully that will really um, explain to people what the system was about. And then, as I said, you head back into the depot. So including boarding and, and getting off the train takes about 17 minutes. And this is just an artist's impression of the projections that you're going to see in the tunnels because um, we're having to use quite high tech projection facility because we're not we're not projecting like this one onto a flat surface there's a lot of nooks and crannies so um, we're using what's called 3d mapping uh, which has pushed the budget up um, but you need to use it to project onto a surface like this so a little bit about the train so <coughs> we are um, we're not going to be using the original rolling stock we are manufacturing two or have manufactured two trains ourselves um, it soon became apparent that we needed to when we ran the business plan and uh, agreed that one would not be enough. We're going to have one uh, rosy red train and we're going to have one racing car green train, which is ironic because it has a top speed of about six miles per hour. Um, but they're, they're loosely modelled on the original rolling stock and they're actually the colours of, of some of the original rolling stock. And they are manufactured by a company called Seven Lamb, who are based in Warwickshire. Seven Lamb specialise in bespoke uh, narrow gauge trains. And um, I think this has definitely challenged them, as it would anyone. Uh, but you know, this is the first time it's been done and these trains are being built for people. So the trains are battery electric. Uh, there's a picture of the actual batteries there. We've um, had to develop, I mean, in, in fact, enhance the capacity of the batteries throughout the design stage because we need not only the trains to run almost continuously throughout the day for visitors, but also to cater for our events functions in the evening. So um, they're pretty hefty. Um, what it also means is that the route that we were running on, we were able to remove the third rail, that conductor rail that Chris again was talking about. Um, and that has allowed us to drop the base of the train. So people are, instead of sitting with your knees up around your, your chin, you can now sit in a seated position, uh, unlike the VIP car, which is knees up around the chin. We have two driver cats, so that's Chris modelling one of them, a, a bit unfinished, but um, as you leave the depot and you set off on your journey, the train is facing one way. As it comes back, it's facing the other way. So the trains need to be driven or drivable from both ends and that's why we have two drive cabs. In addition, having two provides us with some redundancy if there's, if there's a fault on one of them. And again, because you're going to be facing the other direction uh, when you set out on the second ride, we have these flip seats, so the back of the seats flip. The canopies, so we have glass interlocking canopies um, so the driver will be notified when these canopies are locked into the doors and they should not pull away uh, unless they are fully locked. You'll see there there's a picture of them being applied, uh, sorry, of anti-vandal film being applied to them. So we're, we're trying to preserve them because they're very valuable to us. So one of the key constraints we've had is the existing infrastructure of the tunnels. As Chris said, they were built to carry mail, they weren't built to carry people. So we've made these trains as big as they could possibly be without crashing them into the side of the tunnels. We won't get them much longer than 16 metres, and we won't get them any wider than just under a metre. And this diagram here is uh, it's a visual of our narrowest section of tunnel that we're travelling through. It's a seven foot diameter tunnel, and there's two stretches of them. Um, and what we've had to prove through this visual is that you could get out in the event of an emergency. And you could, just about, um, but what it proves is that you certainly couldn't make it any wider. Uh, and at that, at that width and at that length, we can seat a maximum of 32 people. Uh, that's really an adult and a child next to each other, or two quite small petite adults. <laughs> I'll show you a picture in a minute. This on the left, so, so these, these aren't our narrow section of tunnels, but they're pretty narrow. This uh, contraption on the left is what we call the train mule. So Seven Lamb manufactured that for us. It 
uh, it represents the dynamic envelope of the train. So we push that around and that's what we've used to hopefully check that our trains will fit through the tunnels. Um, and our other contractors have also been pushing it around when they, when they want to install lighting, speakers, they need to know that they're not in the way of our trains, essentially. So that's proven to be a useful tool. Uh, and that's myself and Chris sat in one, um, so you can see how big we are in real life, and uh, it was quite cosy. So they're, they're not built for comfort, um, but it's as big as we can get them. And it's all part of the experience as well. So we actually took delivery of these two trains last week. It's a very big milestone for us. And um, there's only one route in and one route out. So they come, I'll show you a picture in a second, but they come down uh, an access shaft. It's the only remaining access point that we have for the whole network to, um, to the surface. So we need to maintain that access shaft, both for our purposes, if we ever need to get the trains out, um, but also for raw mail's purposes, because they still have trains down there. And then, because at the front here we actually have uh, services going in, so we've got pipes all over the floor, we couldn't just use the tracks and run them and then get them onto the incline. They had to be lifted and be run through a hole in the wall just to make things extra complicated. This is a picture of the shaft. It's the original. And uh, here's the hole in the wall. So you see, again, it's not that big. So just touch and go. The trains come in nine parts each. So you've got uh, three passenger carriages, two driver carriages, uh, cabins, sorry, and four bogies. And um, they fit just about, I'll show you. This is a picture of our passenger carriage being craned in last week, uh, just above the shaft. And then you see when it sat at the bottom of the shaft just how tight it was really. So we had to remove some, some scaffolding and a ladder to get it down there, but they're down. Um, and the next stage with them really, they're sat here on the incline waiting <coughs> for the electrics to be reconnected. We need to get them up and running, we need to get them tested. We've got um, the most important test probably, which is the clearance test coming up, where we hope that it won't, <laughs> it won't. Um, <laughs> so we've got that coming up. Um, and that really brings us to the end of our story about Merrill and our plans for the trains. Um, we have a short video to watch, so Barry, if you're happy for us to play that. Um, you can find out more information on our website there. And there's a video, narrated by Dan Snow, he, he'll do much better than I would, explaining uh, a bit more about <coughs> our sponsor of sleeper scheme. So we have had to replace various sleepers and we've had to replace a lot of rail uh, through doing this to make it safe. And, um, and especially as it's coming to Christmas, you're wondering what on earth you could possibly want in your stocking. <laughs> uh, Dan Snow is going to tell you. <laughs> is forever changing. Over time it has grown. 8.6 million people now live within its boundaries. But we've been here before. The last time London's population reached this level was in 1939. And then, as now, there was an inevitable consequence. Speeds of less than 20 miles an hour were a real problem if you had to move 13 million items across the city each day. Fortunately, the engineers of the post office were far-sighted and had seen this coming. Their solution was revolutionary. The world's first underground driverless electric railway.
Today, the tunnels, rails, and trains still exist, but are no longer used. A secret ghost railway hidden from sight and memory deep beneath London's streets. The Post Office Underground Railway was an incredibly innovative railway system and development. It was far, far ahead of its time. It was using technology that is commonplace today, but this is technology that was developed almost 100 years ago. Everything that needed to be done within the railway was done within the railway. So they had a team of workers who worked sorting the post, loading the trains, they had their own engineering team, their own cleaning team. Everything they needed to do was done within the railway, nothing was outsourced or, or brought in. So the people who worked on the railway became more like a community, a family within the, within the working environment. Merrill was mothballed in 2003 and basically the railway was left as it was. All the equipment was still down there, much of the personal effects of people were still down there, the trains were left as they were, and the railway was, was closed down and, and locked up. And, um, and for the last uh, 13, 14 years, that, that railway has, has just remained in this kind of mothball state. For almost 100 years, these tunnels have lain hidden from the public gaze. But everyone will be able to experience them as part of a spectacular new ride when the Postal Museum opens its doors near Farringdon. And you can be a part of it by sponsoring a sleeper. Sponsoring a sleeper or gifting one to someone else will help ensure that mail rail stays accessible to the public for many years to come, helping safeguard its future and giving everyone the opportunity to experience and enjoy this inspiring part of our shared industrial and social history. As part of this unique sponsorship opportunity, you'll be invited into the tunnels to see your sleeper before the attraction opens to the general public. <laughs> be a part of this exciting project today and help us preserve this incredible piece of engineering. To find out more, visit sponsorasleeper.org. the inevitable question first. Do tell us how much it is going to cost to sponsor a sleeper, please. £250. Yeah, there we are. Okay. Right. Um, with, I should say, with that, you do get a ride on the train, uh, you do get a walk the rails for two people, you get to see your name in a pla on a plaque, on a sleeper. Yes. I'm sure there's much, much more. It's all, it's all detailed on um, a piece of paper that's in your update pack that you should have all received. Okay, and if anybody didn't get the leaflet, because I'm not certain there were enough, uh, if you leave your name with Susan afterwards, we're getting some more, uh, and we'll and we'll mail them out to you. So uh, Christmas is coming. Drop broad hints that you know exactly what you want for Christmas. Um, right, um, a very, a very comprehensive, very interesting presentation, but I suspect there will be a number of questions. So uh, let's go straight into that. Uh, in fairness to the people sitting outside who we can't see, I will just try, because they won't be able to hear the question, I'll try and summarise it very briefly before I toss it across the platform. Right, who's going to rush in with the first question? Richard, I can okay, see thank, no, First of all, thank you for a, a, an absolutely fascinating talk. I knew nothing about the museum, so it's got me really excited, having visited the railway 30 years ago uh, on a visit. Uh, what I was particularly <coughs> interested in was the uh, initial pneumatic railway, which strikes me as being something like 30 years ahead of the deep tubes in the first being developed in London. Do we know how far below ground those tubes were and how they were constructed? Were they cut and cover or were they actually bored through the ground on the original pneumatic um, system? Um, they were cut and cover. They, were, they weren't very far underground at all. They were actually quite shallow. They were really literally just under the surface, um, which you know, it had, its, um, had its own kind of uh, problems uh, that, that went alongside it. 
Um, and actually, the reason we know so much about them uh, and, and their existence and, and where they were situated was because after it, it was closed down, essentially, in 1874, um, there was, uh, in 1929, there was a huge explosion at Holborn, and a huge surface area of the road at Holborn was badly damaged, and the cause of it was found to be a build-up of gases in the, um, in the tunnels um, that were part of this pneumatic system. The company who built it, the pneumatic dispatch company, had long since gone out of business. The post office was actually made to um, make good and repair, and that's actually what enabled us to find um, some examples in 1930 when this investigation work was, was happening of the actual rail cars that were used, um, and one of those rail cars is actually part of our collection and will be exhibited in Mail Rail when it opens. Okay. Next one over there. I think it's probably easier if you yeah, you ask the question and I'll briefly repeat it. Yeah. Nick, sorry. All right. Um, I um, visited via Rathburn Place about five years ago in connection with Crossrail, the the uh, system. And in one of the tunnels going off, I think I remember going south from Rathburn Place, there was relics of a locomotive just sitting there. Does that still sit there? Is that going to find its way into your collection? Questions about relics of a locomotive that are still left down on the track. Um, yes, I mean, that was down, down there. A lot of them, they're all still down there. I mean, one or two trains are taken out for various reasons over the years. Um, one or two of them have gone into other collections, for example. Um, we, within the Postal Museum's collection, we have an example of each of the um, basic types of trains, so the, the 1980s Greenback, the 30s English Electric, and the 1927 rail car. We've got the only example of the 1927 rail car. There's a few examples of the 1930s cars out there in other collections. The National Railway Museum, for example, have got one. Um, the rest of the trains, broadly speaking, are still down there. Um, the one, the specifically ones you saw at Rathbone <coughs> Place, have been moved, but there are they are all still around in the network and dotted around at various points. And so we'll be exhibiting some of the trains in the car depot to show people what they look like. Um, but there'll also be one sitting on the tracks that will sort of be you'll go past on the, the passenger train, so you'll get to see it um, in its in its natural environment. You know. Okay, yes. Uh, are there any plans about <coughs> any uses for the rest of the tunnels for cabling, for instance? Any plans for the use of the, uh, the other tunnels which aren't being taken over by uh, the project we've heard about? Not at the moment. I mean, they're all uh, owned by Royal Mail and there are a lot and a lot of cables running through those tunnels already, uh, some third party providers. Um, and we've actually had to identify in our area what they all do. So we know that if we're stripping any out, uh, we're not damaging anything too vital. Um, but as far as, as we know, no, there's no plans to increase the number of cables running through there. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question's about the Princess Royal. Okay. I, I'm aware of some time ago there was a project to extend the use of Bale Rail to the Royal Centre. <laughs> What happened to that plan? <coughs> it just died. Plans, um, plans to extend a uh, mail rail. Yeah, so the, the, the proposal to extend it to the Princess Royal Distribution Centre, it was explored. It, it essentially it did just die in the end. Um, they looked at it they looked at it fairly seriously, and a couple of reports were done, and we, we hold those within the archives. But in actual fact, it was just going to be so expensive, so disruptive, and it was going to, you know, such a complex scheme that I personally think it was, while it was investigated, I don't think it was investigated with any real enthusiasm, to be honest. Um, there was a report done, and we do hold the report, but it's not a very detailed report, and it didn't get very far. Um, but, I, I, you know, it was, it was explored, but um, decided that it was just far too complex and, and expensive. Okay, any more? Yes. So pick it, picking up on that last one, um, the reason you gave for, for closing down the operation was that the mail distribution centres were no longer in those places. <coughs> you moved it all out, you know, quite sensibly to an out of town location. But your customer base, the way you are collecting the mail from and where you're delivering it to, is still in the centre. Does this mean that you're now hanging your future on diesel engines? 
nitrogen dioxide, particulates and other carcinogens. Uh, re uh, reasons, uh, re reasons for closing the railway against the background of concern for the environment. Well, I mean, in, in part, that's a question for Royal Mail, not for the Post Museum. The Post Museum, we don't deliver any mail ourselves. <laughs> but to deal with the issue, which is, comes up every time, this question I think gets asked pretty much every time, about the environmental impact. People say, we closed the railway, underground electric railway, so surely that means you've got millions more vans on the street um, and you're just pushing all of this, uh, all this traffic onto the road. That's not really the case at all. I mean, what the mail was never used to deliver mail. So mail still had to go in vans to get to houses, shops, businesses, schools, etc. Uh, mail rail was used purely to get the, between sorting offices and railway stations. Um, and they looked at all of these arguments prior to the mothballing of the railway and it to, to, to quote um, the manager at the time, we lost the argument on every single front. They never found it cheaper to use mail rail. It didn't actually um, make uh, a, a negative impact on the environment by using more and more vans, because actually the number of vans were still you know, being used. They weren't replacing the vans because they were moving a lot of these operations away from, from central London. Um, they'd always use vans to get mail, for example, to the Heathrow Worldwide Distribution Centre. Um, principal distribution centre they, and, and some of the other big out of London mail centres um, and actually they weren't moving using vans to get to some places like um, the, the, the district offices in London because they were increasingly being closed down so actually more of the sorting was taking place in fewer offices um, so yeah it, you know it, it hasn't the closure of mail rail I, I don't think has had a sort of negative impact on the environment um, but I mean, obviously in terms of Royal Mail's uh, Carbon footprint, you'll have to talk to Royal Mail about it. <laughs> okay, anybody else? One in the middle there. Yep. Are the sleepers down there Jarrah, like the underground? And if so, are they, have they been replaced before? Are the sleepers Jarrah Wood? Much may depend on this answer as to how many donations <laughs> <do> you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're both open Jarrah, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think Royal Mail did run a, a replacement <coughs> programme, but actually, a lot of the ones that we're replacing have been in there for decades and really in need of um, some TLC. So they've been ripped out and, um, uh, yeah, we've replaced a lot of them. Because a lot of them are on the ground, on the underground, six, well, had been 60 years old. Mm. And a lot of these are. I mean, some of them are dating back to the um, 1930s, so they're, they're old. And um, they certainly wouldn't pass any of the health and safety and um, inspectorate checks that we will need to do to take a lot of people on them. Okay, right down front here. Um, <coughs> no, I can probably give the mic, I see you're within walking distance. <laughs> Hello, now, now you mentioned health and safety. Was it true that the, it was very dusty down there when the, the railway was in operation? There was all this Hessian dust from all the mail bags. It was in nylon in the later years, but Hessian originally. Yeah, I mean, th th there was a huge issue with dust, of course. I mean, what they used to find is that you'd have a lot of little small, um, just very, very small, but sort of trackside fires, you know, just sparks, really, where the, obviously the trains and the electric trains, the sparks coming off the, the, the rail, the Conrail, um, would ignite some of this um, uh, some of this dust and debris, in general dust down there. So it was a wasn't a big problem. It never caused you know big fires or anything like that. It was just small uh, issues. But they did you know it was it was an issue without a doubt. Um, in the tunnels themselves, it wasn't quite so bad. Obviously, station areas were, were was a concern. They did actually develop um, back in the nineteen thirties forties a vacuum train, but. Um, by all accounts, from those who who seen it operate, and it hasn't been operated in many, many a year, but from those who saw it operate, it actually generated more dust than it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, it's currently sitting in one of the sidings, doing very little at the moment. So um, but it's still there. Right. On the subject of sponsoring people, have you ever thought of selling off any of the old ones? Selling things off as well as sponsoring. <laughs> 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 no, 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 no. People might want to buy them. Okay. The assets 
belong to Royal Mail, not to not to the Postal Museum. So they're not none of it. None of this is ours. So so it's yeah, yeah. We, it, you know, it, there are there are options, and people have approached us about such things. <coughs> but but as I say, it's more, more Royal Mail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right at the very back. Is there a firm date for the opening of the museum? <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> for every okay, no, uh, the aim is very much spring 2017, uh, and that's what we're all targeting. We're nearly out of, um, I guess, the most difficult part of the construction period, and that's where we have hit hiccups. So over at the Coastal Museum, we found asbestos, for example. Um, kind of a, a multitude of things have sprung up um, that we're nearly out of the danger zone, if you like, and soon, um, towards the end of this year, we'll actually start to fit, fit out the two exhibition spaces. And once they start, uh, really, we're on the final stretch. So there's still quite a lot to do, but spring, I can't give you an exact date, spring is what we're um, reporting. OK, any more? John here, I see, and then over there. So John um, first. There are places on the underground network that are famous for their fauna. For instance, Holloway Road has a subspecies of tailless mouse, mouse, so that tails don't come into contact with the live rails. Um, do, you have, do you have any wildlife down your network? Are there any special forms of wildlife down the road? Remember it is Halloween, no, don't frighten them. There's, there's a resident fox at the moment who keeps uh, walking the roadside, but otherwise, no, it's pretty free of pests, actually, and we want to keep it that way. So uh, how we do that when we have events done there with three-course meals, I don't know. But um, no, it's, it's quite pest-free. Good. Uh, it's Richard, I think, I've seen there, yes? From the... Yeah. What was the, um, to the journey time from one end of the railway to the other? And second question, is so much film from the original railway I've seen a couple of minutes on a online video but um, London Transport on the underground online video but is there much film about? Journey time and availability of archive film. So the journey time, um, it was the quickest <coughs> journey that it, the railway could do from Whitechapel to Paddington was about 18 minutes. But and in reality, it usually took longer than that. Of course, that was 18 minutes without stopping, and pretty pointless running from end to end without stopping. So um, in reality, the journey time took a, a bit longer than that. Um, it was running about six minutes service during the peak of its operation. So if you stood on a platform such as Mount Pleasant, every six minutes another train would come in. Um, so it, was, it ran basically end to end, but there was the option to turn trains around short, and they, they did sometimes do that if they needed to. If they send it all the way down to Paddington, they would turn it round at Mount Pleasant, for example, or, um, or one of the other one of the other stations. Um, so you know there was uh, a number of, um, sort of different options, and so the journey time varied depending on how quickly they loaded the trains up and things. In terms of film, yes, there is bits of film. Um, there are there's a nineteen thirties film called *In the City*, which was um, a, a, a promotional film made by the GPO Film Unit. It used to be the uh, Empire Marketing Board, became the GPO Film Unit. And they made a couple of documentary films. Um, it's featured in a couple of other bits of um, film. It, it featured, for example, many years later on *Blue Peter*. Um, a BBC made a training film down there. Um, in 1987, in coinciding with the anniversary that I mentioned where they rebranded and, and named it Mail Rail and, and the Cowlands on the trains, they made a short 10 minute documentary at that point about it, uh, which gives a very brief history with some very annoying music all the way through. Um, <laughs> spoils it for people generally. Um, it's difficult to get that film nowadays, it's not available on a lot of the uh, things. The best source of film material for it, to be honest, is, is online, of course. YouTube have got a lot of the, the film. And then individuals have made films. And then it, it actually featured in, its, in a film of its own, 1991. It was a film, um, it was the first film that Bruce Willis directed. Um, he also acted in it, and it was a film called Hudson Hawk. By all accounts, it's not a very good film, well, it isn't the first I've seen it. But the but Mera features in it, so it's used as a set. The, the premise of the film is that uh, Bruce Willis is a, a thief trying to steal archives from the Vatican. Um, it's a horrible and nasty thing to do, obviously, being. Uh, somebody who looks after archives for a living. 
Um, and they, they, there was a fabled postal railway under the Vatican, it doesn't exist, no such thing. But they um, filmed it in mail rail and uh, changed all the signs to Latin and changed all the <laughs> words um, to papal references um, and they made this film. Uh, and it, if you get it, you can get it, you can still buy it and you can probably get it online. And it's, it appears for about two minutes, about halfway through the film. And, and there's certainly some film shot by Fred Ivey, one of the friends, uh, which is also online. So if you Google Fred Ivey in Mail Rail, I think you'll find his, uh, his shots as well. Right, time for a couple more, if there are a couple more. Uh, right, OK, I see four hands, so we'll take those four hands. I'll come to the two at the front at the end, but uh, the lady in the middle there. Do you have any plans before the ride officially opens to test it out? Um, by inviting in members of the <laughs> 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 anticipated question about rides beforehand. Uh, it kind of links to the question about when we open. So we can't have too long a test period, um, otherwise we'll never open. However, uh, yeah, we absolutely need to test it uh, before we accept paying customers to come through and test it. Um, and one of the groups that we are looking to test it with are the people who have sponsored a sleeper. Um, so yes, we, we, we need to do a lot of um, work on how we batch the trains because as I said, it's you'll just about fit two adults next to each other at a push. Um, so we really need to look at the best way of loading those trains is to get people on and off as quick as possible. So there's going to be a hell of a lot of testing done in, in the lead up to opening. We have what's called a, a four week mobilisation period in which that will be done. You'll have a lot of volunteers. I know, yeah. And Jabbar did warn us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. there was one somewhere in the body of the hall at the end of the road there, another lady, and then I come to the two at the front. When KUB shut down and got pulled down and re rebuilt, is there still access from this new office? Um, did you even uh, can you wrap that up uh, in the answer? Yeah, sorry, sorry. So when uh, King Edward uh, Building closed uh, in 1998, um, and the building, um, apart from the facade of the building, was pulled down. Um, so no, there's no access to mail rail from KB at all. It's completely capped off. So basically the facade of the building, which is a listed structure, survives. Um, and then if you go and you visit, you go to King Edward Street, where it is, and you look behind, you see a brand new building. Brand new, but a new building um, at the back, um, and there's no, there's no physical access between KB, the building on the site of KB, and the railway underneath. The only way to get to the station at KB is through the tunnel from either Liverpool Street or Mount Pleasant. Okay, last two down the front. I'll hand them over to the person and gentleman who hasn't asked a question, and then to John. Oh, thank you. Right, I seem to remember there was an open day um, at the Post Office Railway about 40 or 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. I remember being down there, maybe some other people in here as well, and we were shown how it worked and everything. And it was absolutely fascinating. And there were first day covers also available. I think I've still got mine. Do you remember? <laughs> Have you any memory of that or knowledge of it? Um, <laughs> certainly, uh, I remember it four years ago. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, there were open days, yeah. Royal Mail did do open days as part of the... Um, again, it coincided a lot of it with the sort of anniversary of the railway. Uh, there was a time where they sort of promoted... Look, that's why they did things like Blue Peter and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, they had open days and they did take groups around and things. And, yeah, there were, were first day covers. We've got some first day covers in the collection. But, um, yeah, there were, there were various things done in association with it. But they were short-lived and there were, you know, relatively small numbers of people in the great scheme of things, you know. Um, thank you. Uh, my last question is, uh, as a former inmate of a railway control room, was it a scheduled service and was there actually a controller who actually monitored the service levels and frequency to actually adjust the service? Um, yes, there was. Uh, there was a frequency. There was a, there was a timetable, essentially, that it ran to. Um, they actually ran the trains in set, so they had sort of set numbers and there was sort of an expected route that those, um, those trains as those sets took um, and yeah there was a controller that, that oversaw that and actually it was quite a high pressured environment I mean it, you know while it was you know not carrying people who were going to complain that the, the service was delayed it was carrying post but it's very important to get on time because obviously they had to meet the travelling post offices and the travelling post offices wouldn't leave 
Liverpool Street, for example, late, it would go on time. And if the mail wasn't there, the train went without it. And that would mean that, that post wouldn't get to its destination that day. So the controller was very, very keen on ensuring the, the, the speed of the, of the service, really, and ensuring that targets were met. And actually, they monitored it. They actually introduced a barcode system to monitor how long mail was taking in the railway because the railway always maintained that it wasn't the source of these hold-ups that it was the sorting offices above and they actually proved that in the end by this barcode system they found that actually the railway was very efficient but sometimes when the mail got above ground it's where it met with its delay yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah they, they were very keen on uh, maintaining that and uh, keeping you know, speed of service was, was very important okay i think i've got to draw a line there so i'm conscious of the time we, we, we're continuing outside so we'll give you a chance to ask further questions privately to, to Hannah and Chris outside. Um, before I come to the thank yous, can I just say two things. Um, Hannah's reference right at the beginning of the presentation to those magic words, hidden London, uh, reminds me to say something which I omitted to say at the very beginning, uh, and that is that the next tranche of hidden London tours for 2017 is due, all being well, to be, a net, to be made open for booking on Monday the 21st of November. Now the museum has very kindly again given the friends the unique capability of booking on that Monday. Nobody else will have that availability. It opens to the public generally later on in the week. So a key date is Monday the 21st of November. The way that will work as it's worked before is that in the week beforehand, probably on the Tuesday, all the friends will be emailed uh, the website address for bookings uh, and then on the Monday morning the following week you will be emailed the code that you will need to access that uniquely as a friend. So the key date is really the 21st of November uh, but you should have some more details in an email in the week beforehand and that will be to us largely partly in the, uh, to some of the existing places that are featured in Hidden London but there will be some new places opened up, including particularly Highgate, uh, the upstairs part of Highgate, uh, which of course was a fair bit of construction was done for the northern extensions, but not actually uh, delivered uh, after the war. Uh, so that's that. Uh, the second one is the usual announcement that as we adjourn outside, for those who wish to, uh, there'll be the usual uh, refreshments, uh, and please make an appropriate donation uh, to help cover the cost of that. Uh, and finally, and by no means least, our thanks to Chris and Hannah um, for a most comprehensive presentation covering not only the history of Mail Rail but also the very exciting plans that we see before us for spring in 2017. Um, I suspect you've left us in the mood of desperately wanting to know more about it and to see more about it, and that is the very state you want us to be in to give generously, I'm sure, to the, uh, to the sleeper appeal. So I hope some people will take that up. That is the certain way of getting some of the prior views that you obviously will want. Uh, all I will say in return is that there is a willing band of volunteers here to be called upon if you wish to test the evacuation process. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for turning out in such uh, good numbers. Um, I can only apologise to those who won't hear the apology, which is those who sadly didn't manage to get in, but there's only a few of those. Uh, and I'd ask you just to show your appreciation in the usual way to our two speakers. Today.